And Dulce, in your talk, you talked about um, being influenced by documentary photography in Mexico. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about some of your influences and, and expand on that. I, and then sort of on the reverse, I wonder, Colin, if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the contemporary artists who are creating work, um, just mention some of those that might relate to the strategies or the type of work that Arnold Newman is creating. And similarly, Ty, when I was seeing your presentation, I was you know, trying to think of films, clips in the last five years uh, that you know, employ some of the strategies uh, that, that you're talking about, whether it's a particular director or actor or actress who has benefited from those, those classical uh, close-ups uh, and long pauses. So first, Dulce, if you could start us off with a little history. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, documentary photography was implicit in my education. Um, the, the first picture I saw was Al Manuel Alvarez Bravo, the sleeping woman. So that um, image stuck in my head um, that uh, when I first took my first class, I did the same with my best friend. It was very hard uh, to escape from that imaginary, but especially from that school. Um, I knew later on that it was a very conscious process to, to get far from that, but somehow I, I kept coming back and back. And um, all through, through my, my work, all my se different series have some sort of document documentary style in it. It's, it's very different, the approach and the, and the topics, of course, but um, always, always um, come back to um, even, even if I, the, 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 um, the scenography is very fictional, they always re, um, come back to the document. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, can, I guess I can't escape from yes, it. Yes, yes, and I, I love that you mentioned that photograph. We just received that photograph as a gift, that Manuel Alvarez Bravo. At huh. the end of 2012, our, our first photographs by Alvarez Bravo, one of which is on view, the dancer's daughter, but good reputation sleeping, the woman sleeping is, is a, a recent gift as well. So, Colin. Um, <clears throat> I think if I were to point to one contemporary portraitist and how he relates to what Penn was doing and Avedon was doing, and more importantly, especially what Newman was doing, it might be Martin Scholler. Uh, Scholler's been photographing, doing portraits a lot for the New York Times. He's been in the New Yorker. Uh, he has access to lots and lots of stars. Uh, and every one of them gets photographed in exactly the same way. He comes in tighter than a mug shot. He does amazing things with light. He can flood a face with light, even at very, very close range. And the result is, and in fact, his latest project, uh, which he had an exhibition of in Los Angeles uh, about a month and a half or so ago, um, <clears throat> was um, he's photographing twins which is perfect because he's making everybody look exactly the same. Uh, <clears throat> the nature, the aesthetic is so overpowering, so tightly cropped, so inescapable, and so uniform from one picture to the next that any of the variety, <clears throat> any of the sort of notion of differentness or, or of graphic difference that someone like not only Newman, although Newman is the, is the prime example of it, but even Penn and Avedon, in a certain way, gave people space for their own individuality. Shoulder levels it. And I think it ties into some of what you're saying about today and the fact that everybody's self-invented and everybody's the same. Right. Everybody's every man. And the frame is all, almost <clears throat> the same. Yeah, right. Um, uh, so trying to answer your question, basically, is, is are there any stars who are taking that, that um, self-invention and realism and applying it to their roles in movies? Is, mm -hmm. is, 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 in a way, I don't think that's happening in the movies because the movies resist. When we go to see a movie on a big screen, um, we still want to see projected glamour of some sort. Uh, you do get, there has been this rising genre of what are called found footage uh, entertainment, starting with Blair Witch Project and the Paranormal Activity movies. Um, and you can't have a star in that. You can't have a famous name in that because that explodes the notion that these films are about are really happening. That they're you know actually filmed you know they're filmed actuality. 
Uh, everybody knows that's not true, but that's the illusion that you enter into. You, you know, that's the bargain you make with these films. Um, but Hollywood still, rather old-fashionedly, sells glamorous movie stars from George Clooney to Anne Hathaway, to even you know a new face like you know. Um, Oh, God, what's her name? Uh, Jennifer from Hunger Games and... Um, Lawrence. Lawrence, thank you. Um, is marketed as a new glamour figure and ends up on the cover of magazines. Even if you've seen Winter's Bone, you know that she can play very, very realistic, non-glamorous figures. Um, what I think the smarter, younger actors are aware of and are doing is that they are happy to play glamorous figures in big screen films. You know, Ryan Gosling, for instance, uh, James Franco, um, Emma Stone, but they will go off and they'll do interesting projects in other formats, in other corners, and other mediums, whether it's doing something on YouTube, whether it's uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt doing his projects online. Um, but they know that they can't go against the glamour of the large screen image, and they know that's actually an important part of their brand, their self-image, their, their selling of themselves, their career, their artistic, you know, their successfully, commercially successful artistic career. Mm -hmm. what, what about Blanchett? In, the, in her move to Jasmine from, from having played, you know, opposite, uh, you know, from, ha from having done uh, uh, Blanche. In, um, yeah. Well, I think actually <laughs> what, um, I, I actually do talk a bit, a, a bit about this in, in my book. The modern star understands that they don't have a fixed persona anymore, but they really have almost a binary persona because of the establishment of this sort of alt channel of alternative culture. So there you have the mainstream movies, Avengers and whatnot, and you have the independent art house stuff. Um, and an actor, if they want to be both commercially successful, make a lot of money, and be artistically respected, creatively respected, they have to go back and forth between them. And it's a very delicate juggling act. And somebody like Kate Blanchett, um, if, and if they can go to the stage and go to the, you know, and do a Broadway play, even that gives them even more artistic cachet. Um, and, you know, the, the smart and creative stars of today are able to go back and forth and do interesting work in smaller, less financially rewarding films, um, and yet hold up their end of a blockbuster as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before I ask any other questions, do some of you have some questions that you would like to ask our speakers? Oh, oh, wonderful. Uh, thank you all. Where do you, you guys... Um, see the photographic art, the photographic portrait, going in the next decade? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I think that, um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it's a good question because uh, the ubiquity of cell phone pictures, the fact that, I, I remember, um, this doesn't have to do with portraiture, but it does have to do with channels, with where people get the images they use. Uh, Philip Gefter, uh, who wrote on photography for the New York Times for a number of years, was also the page one editor, uh, picture editor of the New York Times for a number of years, including on 9-11. And he called everybody he could think of, every photojournalist who was in town he could think of, <clears throat> but he also absolutely scoured the internet and put on the front page of the Times a picture that a guy had taken from over in Brooklyn who was an amateur photographer. <clears throat> and that picture became the iconic picture. He happened to be taking a picture of the first tower burning at exactly the moment the second plane hit the second tower. Um, and a lot of, I think, portraiture is, is almost comparably going to be coincidental. Uh, cell phone pictures, uh, you know, I'm, I'm <clears throat> doing some work now that has to do with a photographer who um, was stopped from photographing by the police in a subway station uh, and got into an argument with the policeman. And the policeman knew that this guy had a creepy peepee on him, a little buttonhole camera and a video set up, and was shooting the policeman talking to him. Um, and, you know, that work has become a bigger work than the pictures the guy was taking at this point. So I don't, you know, I have no idea where commercial, as I say, it's, Scholler's interesting right now because uh, beyond him lies looking up somebody's nostrils or something like that. You know, it's gotten so tight, it's so hard to capture, to still that face and to make a mark doing it commercially because nobody knows where it's gonna go next. 
also wonder if the aesthetic, well, I think the aesthetic of the selfie has already sort of permeated um, uh, the less high art, fine art uh, portraiture. Um, and I think people will, you know, as you can see by that, the, video, the last video I had uh, there, people are already starting to play with it in interesting ways. Um, I don't know how far you can take that, but I'm interested to see. I also think that with uh, everyone being a potential photographer, we, we um, still as a society looking for, for something that has, I call it meat in the bone. Like um, everything now is so uh, really speedy and everything is, is basically very irrelevant that images tend to disappear. And more and more I think we feel that we need to sort of like perpetuate the, the, the um, certain quality of images. And I, I don't feel that um, photography as, you know, as an exhibition, as a book, that are going to disappear. I think uh, they're just going to be seen by more people. And um, I think uh, photographer, photography, it's um, more than ever collected internationally. And I feel like the future for photography is very bright. I, um, I feel that uh, commercialization of, of certain um, artists uh, generate um, that the market gets more and more interested in um, emerging um, photographers. And I feel that that's very uh, amazing. That's very, very cool. I, was, I just wanted to add to this, what you're saying, and then we'll, we'll take a question. But you know, for us at the museum, I think the Newman exhibition presented this really interesting opportunity to talk to our audiences at large about just images, because you know, we're all bombarded with images constantly, whether we're watching films or you know, advertisements. And we've done a couple of different iPhone programs. Last night, Ben Lowy, uh, a photojournalist, um, did a workshop for our museum. Uh, he's a photojournalist who's been working in Iraq and has been primarily taking iPhone pictures. And we did an iPhone contest. Um, but at the same time, I think we were really careful to acknowledge that what Newman was doing is completely different you know, in terms of uh, his approach and structure uh, from the iPhone. So I, I like these relationships and how we can talk about photography more broadly, but, but also nice to, to always make the distinction. So thank you. You've been very patient. I have a question over there. I'll say you, um, in your superheroes series, worked on it from 2005 to 2010. Is there a current project that you are working on that you're involved in, a, like a big project right now? Um, yes. I think the most difficult part of, of um, Creatively Wise was to break with the superheroes uh, project and start a new, a new um, body of work. It was very hard, the transition between the success of that project and having to start another project. Maybe not as successful. I, I, that wasn't the intention for, for that project, but just to be as meaningful to me personally. So um, I started this project called People I Like. It was very mediatic. I think it was more like an exercise and a transition project through another um, um, project I'm, 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 doing, I'm doing now. Um, when my first uh, baby was born, that was like a, a breakthrough moment in my life, and I started to, to um, be more, more concerned about issues that I, I was uh, dealing before as uh, environment, and, and, and also uh, doing different um, uh, exercises with light, and, and putting things in scene, like uh, creating new scenes. So I went to a museum in Puebla, uh, in, in the in, in a natural history museum uh, in the 80s, uh, opened its, its doors. And when I was nine, I went and visited dioramas. And I was completely uh, mesmerized by the uh, imaginary there and being able to travel around the globe without leaving my city. And um, coming uh, 20 years later and seeing that dioramas being totally destroyed because that museum has become um, a museum of science. So they, they, they kept, they left one whole floor um, of the dioramas 
being, and, and the animals dissected being everywhere, you know, just uh, keeping dust. And then for me, that was a point where I, I realized that that was a project, a new project for me that to start and, and, and to live for. And then I spent a whole year coming back and forth from Mexico City to, to, to Puebla to, to create these images. And um, that made me very happy. It hasn't been as successful and exposed as the superheroes, but for me, it was very important to break that project in many different ways, aesthetically, um, uh, the way of, of shooting, the whole process, and especially change a subject. I was not going to be, you know, like the superhero photographer forever. Adriana. Hi, again, thank you very much, all three. But my question is also directed to Dulce. And um, interested as I am in, well, art history and art itself, but also being a Latina woman myself, I was curious to see whether you have felt any like distinction or that you are expected to bring out certain type of job because of your identity or if you can talk to us about that, being a Latina woman, you mentioned something that you were the first Latina woman at, I, I couldn't get the name of the museum, but- Moncler Art Museum. Exactly, if you can talk, I mean, tell us something about that. Yeah, it is very hard to break the stereotypes. I have been uh, asked many, many times to, to show under the context of Chicana, mm -hmm. and I always get, ooh, because I am, I, and I tell, no, thank you. I'm not a Chicana. I mean, there's, there's a, this, it has to be a very explicit distin distinction that be, from being a Mexican uh, artist living in New York and a Chicana, which is an, a, 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 a Mexican um, who has lived and emancipated in LA. And um, I don't want to get my work labeled as Latina because that project happened to be um, the reflection of Mexican workers in New York, but it, it could have been done by a Chinese or a man or a gay man. It doesn't matter if I am a woman or Latina, it's just that I happen to have that idea and I, you know, I um, shoot it that way. And, and Mexico happened to be my community and, and, and but uh, my work has been uh, not only the superheroes, my whole body of work talks about many different things, as race, as identity, as um, different um, uh, ways of seeing life, portraiture. So yes, I'm very aware of that, and I try always uh, to put my, feet down, my, my foot down and say, no, I, it, I'm, it's not because I am a Latina. It's just because I'm an artist and I'm a photographer. Any other? Oh, we have a question in the back. Most of these pictures were on film, if not all of them. If you change the technology to me? the digital, can you do the same kind of work? You're is, talking to me? Is the, the things displayed essential to using film, or could you do the same kind of, of photos with the current uh, digital uh, techniques, technology? The, um most of the photographers I know who uh, trained themselves, established themselves in the film, the analog era, are still shooting film and then scanning it, uh, and scanning the negatives to get the prints, making a test print and then scanning the print, but usually scanning the film and from there on it becomes a totally digital process. I think the fusion between the two is going to be fairly seamless. Um, the issue, you know, between the fantasists who can make a photograph that's, you know, something that's not reality at all and, do, you know, and doesn't pretend to be, and the people who make photographs that are absolutely reality, that that divide will continue to exist and won't have that much to do with which technology you're using. Um, I'm going to answer that as a photographer. Sure. I was very reluctant to do that that change until I moved to Mexico and based in a different economy, um, I have to switch to digital 
very quickly. I didn't know anything about digital camera. I remember my first digital camera was a 1.7 megapixel <laughs> camera I bought in on GNR for a, sh for a job I got at, at, at the New York Road Runners Club. I have no idea how to use that camera, but I, I, I use it for a job. But then later, as technology has progressed, I have been switching uh, little by little, as, 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 as uh, you mentioned. Um, first, I used to scan, because I, I went to ICP, and ICP let you use all these nice scanners, you know, uh, and, and, but when I moved to, to Mexico, I have to switch. But now technology is getting here versus uh, film is getting less and less rare to, to, to find. And the process for processing film, labs are so expensive now. In Mexico, there's no labs. So uh, technology is getting much better. And then you can now do that. Switch is more, it's, it's mostly mental than actually the technology uh, uh, switch. So I guess um, I try to, to keep shooting with my same camera now. My camera is kind of like in, right like there, the Mamiya 7.2 as a uh, sort of like a um, museum, in a museum, because it's obsolete. So now I have a Canon camera. It's wonderful. I'm very happy. And also I, I trick myself to think that. You know, it doesn't matter if I shoot with a cell phone or if I shoot with a Hasselblad. What matters is, you know, as I mentioned before, the, the meat in the, on the bone. What, one of the things that's forcing the change, too, is that uh, from Polaroid to Eastman Kodak, film companies are going out of business. Uh, you can't get film at any price, and soon there will. I know that uh, Chuck Close, whom I've been doing a project with lately, told me that uh, the end of 2014, or sometime in 2014, will be the end of all the Polaroid that's left in the world. Uh, and he's got a certain amount reserved. He's used it as a basis both for his paintings and as his own photography since the 1970s. But he's not desperate about this situation. He's looking at the new technologies. I, he, I did a project with him in the 90s that got him interested in daguerreotypes, and he's had a field day with those. He doesn't use them as a basis for painting, but he does scan them and use them. He's lately been turning them into uh, uh, tapestries done on a jacquard loom. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the amount of inventiveness that can go on is expanding, but the technologies that we're familiar with and that have provided the standards are going to materially disappear. They're going to financially disappear. I would like to see a, por you know, a portrait of Brian Gosling on a Jacquard Lou. No. That would be interesting. <laughs> They, he's done some incredible, yeah. he's done one of Liechtenstein that's the size of one of these doors. Wow. It's amazing. <laughs> anyway, so. Yeah, I think just as far as, as star portraiture, um, I mean, and digital versus uh, film, it all can come down to that, that Brando Dean photograph I showed earlier. People used to collect images of stars, you know, fan, fans collect photos, now they can manipulate them and tweak them and trade them. Um, and so there's that uh, empowerment going on. Um, just going back to a, a little bit to what we're talking about, what, what the future of uh, portraiture is, I do want to mention that you know, because of sites like Pinterest and Tumblr, I think there is a whole new appreciation for classic star portraiture. Mm -hmm. um, and classic photographs. And lighting. And lighting. Mm -hmm. um, and you, 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 uh, those images are disseminated much more broadly than they used to and coming to you know, the, the attention of more and more people and younger and younger people. So um, I, I think that's a good thing. Hi, I wanted to ask a question, sorry to do this to you, about the Marilyn Monroe photograph. Um, <laughs> I guess of all the famous names in the exhibition, that's a name I readily recognize. Some of the others I recognize, but would never know a face with their name anyway. So what struck me about the Marilyn Monroe photograph was that it's so opposite of all of the glamorized mm -hmm. pictures of her, obviously. And I wanted to get your opinion about, well, first I wanted to know how was it published and or received at, the, at its time, with what was published in 1962 after it was taken, and um, where was he going with that? Obviously, he took a, ca a candid shot of her, unauthorized, 
And was he trying to sort of show a stripped down tragic figure? How, how did that layer get added onto he, it? He published it after she died and he received a lot of criticism for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he cut it out. It's so grainy because he cut it out of a 35 millimeter negative. Carl Sandburg was in the thing. They were sort of clowning around and so forth. And, and of course, this was the year she died, as I recall. Uh, and after she died, he had this picture, uh, and he knew that it was a very poignant image where she just kind of uh, went like that for a minute. And he published, he cut it out. He, he didn't try and gussy it up as, what, as something it wasn't. He printed it grainy just as, as it came, uh, and he took a lot of heat for it. He was lucky to take it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he, yeah, yeah. It was, again, him having access to all kinds of milieus that most portrait photographers who work out of studios just never see. Yeah, but I, I think that even, even, at the, at, even at that time, I think there already existed this sort of two views of Marilyn. It's, there's this, her iconography is twofold. There's the glamour, and then there's the shadow Marilyn. And, and even before her death, because of her troubles, her divorces and stuff, people were interested in the shadow Marilyn, but you really didn't have the, the images to go with it. Um, Although, you know, she was doing stuff with Bert Stern, you know, the, 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 the nude shots. Uh, she was doing a lot of interesting photography that didn't come out till later. But I think in the wake of her death and the sort of uh, culture of, of um, you know, cultural necrophilia that surrounds her, her, her image today, people are always on the hunt for the real Marilyn, whatever the real Marilyn is. Um, and so when we look at that shot, we think, oh, that's the real Marilyn. Or we look at the Bert Stern. Or, or whatever, as opposed to, well, you know, the, the, the glamour Marilyn gets encrusted to the point of the Andy Warhol silkscreen, um, or the iconic shot of the subway grate, you know, blowing up her skirts. Um, God knows what the real Marilyn was. Uh, you know, we just keep searching these images, hoping to find it. What can you? Uh, ex what's happening with the Misfits? Why is the Misfits not being re-released? Why is it tied up? Because that seems to be, that the story of the making of that film, the last film she made was The Misfits. Uh, it was sort of the end for Gable in a way, too. Right, but, it was. Uh, it was yeah. his last film as well. Yeah, and Montgomery Clift. <laughs> right, mean, it, was, it was the end of the film. And, and, and the production people. was a nightmare. Right, uh, John and, Huston running it. Oh, my God. Right, yeah. And, I wasn't uh, aware that it had been held up. I, you can't get it on Netflix. You can't find it at Amazon. Huh, because it was available for, I mean, it's was on, it? I've seen it on videotape, you know, back mm -hmm. in the VHS days. I don't know if it's ever been on DVD. It, I'm sure it's a rights issue. A lot of, especially in the late 50s, early 60s, as the studios began breaking down and, and um, uh, you started to get financing for film for all different sources, you often run into rights issues, especially in yeah, that yeah, time yeah, period. Yeah. So that's probably why. Yeah, it was an indie film, which yeah. was a, a funny structure in those right, days. Right, exactly. So I'm sure that's the reason. It's... And, and it was a movie that tried to get to a more real or raw Marilyn than existed, black and white. She was starting to age past the age that we allow our movie starlets to age. Um, I often think that if she hadn't died, I mean, God, if she mm. lived to, into the 70s, and can you imagine her working with Scorsese or Coppola mm -hmm. or, mm. you know, and into the, and, and if she had lived to the independent film era mm. um, or even the 70s New Hollywood, it might have, she might not have worked well at all, but she might have done some amazing mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And we might have found a real Marilyn, or we might still be looking. Mm. Well, it's not just much a question. A thank you very, very much to all thank of you. you, but I don't want to forget our fourth and first speaker. <laughs> Often you forget the first speaker, and <laughs> have not. She was the most articulate <laughs> introduction speaker I've heard for a long time and made it very clear and very thoughtful about why we have this show, um, you know, in the first place here and the nice um, inclusion of the bios by the photographs is helpful. I've been a couple of times through it and, and thoroughly enjoyed it and you've enlarged everything greatly and to Dulce. That's all. <laughs>
thank you so much for your feedback about today. And I can think of no better moment to close on in acknowledging Dulce mm -hmm. as our living artist here today and, and representing the artist voice from our Double Portraits exhibition. Um, thank you, Ty. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, thank you Dulce, for thank being you. here. I thoroughly enjoyed hearing your presentations. Many thanks to all of you. I would just like to encourage you, if you have not been or if you would like to go again, we are open. Please come and see Arnold Newman Masterclass, our Double Portraits exhibition. My colleague Alexander Jarman mentioned we are in day three of a 10-day Contemporary Arts Festival, so keep coming back. If you'd like to see the Arnold Newman exhibition at 3 a.m., you can. <laughs> Starting on August 8th, we will be open 24 hours, oh. so please come and see us. And if you are photography buffs, we have Kurt Simonson also speaking, who's featured in the Double Portraits exhibition. So that's coming up this week. Alexander, I think there are the pamphlets about, the booklets about our 10-day contemporary festival. So please pick one up. And thank you all very much. It's very meaningful to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.